All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Open Library Community Forum. Uh, we're waiting for our presenters to get on, to get set up, and we'll start shortly. Um, I see uh, Philip has just joined, uh, so I'll go ahead and welcome everyone to the forum. Uh, this is a place to come together and discuss issues related to library services and management, and how to leverage information technology to address these issues. Uh, we'll, we'll be hosting forums every two weeks, uh, and you can participate in addition to the forum um, by following our uh, online web forum at for, uh, discuss.folio.org or the Slack channels, um, folio-project.slack.com, um, and the wiki, wiki.folio.org. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Philip, who has been working on the user experience for the Folio platform. Um, and like in the past, uh, please submit questions as we go along, and if they're not answered during the presentation, they'll be answered at the end or online afterwards. So I'll hand it over to Philip now. Um. Thanks, Jack. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes, good. we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, let me just start by sharing my screen. That's allowed. Okay. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yes. All right. Good. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the user experience process that we've been having for this uh, project. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm going to get into what thoughts we've been putting into the, the user experience, user interface, interaction design, uh, how um, the research we've been doing has affected the decisions we've made, and, and so on. But maybe I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Philip Jacobson. I'm a UX and interaction designer based in Copenhagen. And I work as a consultant for index data on this project. Um, yeah, so like I've written here in the title of my presentation, uh, I really think that uh, that Folio should be an LSP for regular human beings. Some of the, the things we've seen in the industry have been quite difficult uh, to use. So, so that's, um, that's something that's very important to me, and obviously that's why why I'm involved in this project. Uh, yeah, so in this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about the very basics of this new system. Uh, so nothing I present is 100% set in stone. I think we're finding a good direction, but uh, yeah, I mean, everything is still open to debate, and obviously, uh, we want to make the best product we can. Uh, so the more feedback we get, the better. Uh, obviously, deadlines. Uh, put a, a limit to how much discussion we can have, but um, but sometimes it's also better to to get feedback once the the product is getting uh, started slowly, uh, getting out there because it's easier to move a car that's driving rather than one that's holding still, as they say. Uh, yeah. So so the starting point for me and the reason I think it's really interesting to be a part of this folio project uh, has been the fact that. Libraries enable great research. So the, all the, the fantastic progress we've had for humankind, a lot of it comes from amazing science that has led to discoveries, that has led to innovation. And uh, if you look, if you go uh, down to the root of, of all those great things, it, it, uh, it starts with uh, well, institutions of learning and the people who, who work there. And, and they're oftentimes assisted by uh, by libraries. So I think that what we should aim for in an LSP library services platform is uh, to make sure we provide the best possible infrastructure for this support for for research. So that that kind of perspective, and, and I guess most people who work in the library industry are, already has this perspective, but it but it's uh, it's quite different from saying we want to make a better ILS or we want to make um, something that supports the workflows of libraries because putting the focus on the, the people that libraries are there to support 
being the researchers and the and people in academia, uh, really, yeah, gives a different perspective and opens up for some new opportunities. Um, so yeah, like I was talking about the all the all the great discoveries of of science leading to an advancement for humankind, uh, and and all that starting with researchers and and the people who support them. Uh, it's all about humans. So I think an LSP should be to, I mean, it shouldn't be something that that's, that makes life difficult or makes it difficult to, to support researchers. Uh, and yet I've heard things said like uh, a librarian who said that, uh, that librarians are oftentimes prisoners of their own software systems, uh, not because they want to be, but just because of the workflows that are forced upon them by uh, rigid systems and that are that that don't always take the human factor into consideration, which is a shame, uh, and which is yeah, the, which is why I'm uh, I'm doing what I'm doing to avoid that kind of situation. So the the vision for this folio system, if you ask me and if you ask us in the UX group, um, is to create a system for human beings and then making the the machines work hard to create a great result and not the other way around. So we want to make um, make it more manageable to run a library. I am working together with a handful of people that I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, and what we do in, in this little group that we have uh, is that we work in the cross section between technology, uh, human psychology, and the context that, that humans are uh, are in so the technology for this project uh, is uh, based around this whole idea of using these microservices and doing a, a modular kind of platform where um, all the functionality isn't defined from the beginning from the outset. It's but the but the but the basis is so we need to find a good way to basically enable other people to create great things for this platform. And obviously the things that are in the platform to begin with need to, to work well. Um, so that's the technology side of this project. And obviously everything else that deals with consumer electronics, because we all use them, um, plays into that as well. On the human side, things are more universal. Uh, there's some principles in human psychology that that are true everywhere, and that means that there are some principles in how you design interfaces that are true everywhere. Not in the specifics, perhaps, but in the principles. Um, and then we have the context, of course, and this is what makes every technology project different. Um, in this case, the context is the fact that uh, we're building a system for libraries, and there are certain workflows certain institutions with certain hierarchies that need to be supported by it. Uh, and also, we need to think about what uh, libraries will be doing in the future, uh, what, there's, what libraries are starting to do now. So this is the, the context. So if you combine all of these factors, uh, you are in the, in the place where the, the UX group is, is working. Um, I'm just going to mention quickly um, a little bit about the structure of this project because it seems to um, to have confused uh, a lot of people exactly what, how does it work and who's in charge of what and is everything yeah how does everything fit together I'm not, I'm not going to get into specifics as you, as you can probably read from my very detailed diagram with no labels but um, but the way that uh, the project is set up right now is that we have uh, these um, concentric circles of, of groups of people or of people. And uh, in the middle, we have a, a bunch of different small teams. So we have um, a developer team working hard on creating a good uh, backend basis and frontend basis for the, for the platform, all the functionality. Uh, all the good algorithms and so on. And then we have a UX team, which is the one that I'm a part of. Uh, and we have some people working with strategy. And we have some people working with communication. So there are a bunch of different uh, people um, here in this middle circle. And then out here, we have uh, other small groups. So we're starting to create these uh, special interest groups with 
people who are experts in their field who can uh, give feedback on what works in real life because even though I'm a good UX designer, I, I don't know the the reality of libraries because I haven't worked in a library for many years like like a lot of you guys have. So we really need to get get the feedback from you guys. And that's what these special group, interest groups are, are all about. So there's a constant communication both within the groups in here and between the the groups uh, in the outer circle. And then, of course, out here we have everyone else, the public or anyone who has just a small interest in the project. Um, so I think the structure works pretty well. We're still refining it, still trying to figure out exactly how to do it best, um, but, but that's what it looks like right now. Um, I'd also like to say a quick word on, uh, in, in terms of speaking of the, the process for this and the setup for the whole project. Um, if you look at uh, software development as it, as it has been done uh, for a while and unfortunately still is in some places, uh, the, pro the process looks like this. You have some strategy first, then you have uh, some development, technical development. Uh, based on what the big idea that someone had, then you create something very specific, and then afterwards someone realizes, oh wait, we sh what about I heard about this UX? It's a really good idea. It makes you know it makes the products better, and then someone you know you can try and put on some user a better user interface, better colors, nicer fonts, a uh, little bit of restructuring. But what you often at times end up with is just basically decorating the stuff that's already been built and it doesn't really make much of a difference. So it may, may make stuff look more modern, but the, the it's, yeah, it doesn't really change how well products work. So a better way to do it uh, with, is, is this process where you have the strategy, someone has the big idea and, and the plan, uh, and then that goes into some kind of human-centered process where we try and figure out how can we translate this great idea into an actual user interface, an actual, uh, some good user flows and so on. And then that gets sent, shipped on to development. This has also happened many times and I'm sure you guys have been using products in your lifetime that, that has used this kind of process. The challenge with this uh, process that's sometimes called the over the wall process because there's kind of a brick wall put in between each step of the process is that you, you create something, you create a, a great idea, you throw it over the wall to the, next to the next group of people, and then some design is created, and you throw it over the wall and some people program uh, the product. The problem with not having that dialogue ongoingly is that, uh, first of all, you miss out on a lot of great innovation that could be done, because oftentimes the developers will have uh, input, like they found a new technology that enables you to do something nice and to create a good user experience, or the user experience people have a good idea for a strategic move that you could do. So if it only goes one way, that's a, not a very uh, efficient uh, way to do a project, and the quality really falls down a lot. So the way that the Folio project is being run uh, is more something like this, a more agile approach where, um, yeah, there's a back and forth between the people doing strategy, the people doing the design, and the people doing the design, and the people doing the development, and all three groups talking together, which I think is a really great thing. Uh, and so that's reflected in the fact that right now the programmers are already programming, uh, the designers are already designing, and the strategic people are already uh, way into the future about all the strategic stuff, and also taking care of the, the stuff that's uh, coming up soon. Um, yeah, so the process that I'm uh, involved in uh, is this uh, user experience, user interface, and interaction design uh, um, process. And um, let me just find my, yeah. Uh, so these abbreviations, if anyone's wondering, is user experience, user interface, and user, no, interaction design. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's where where I'm doing my work, and I'm doing it together with uh, Charlotte Ritz and Deep Honor, uh, doing uh, some requirements gathering and analysis of existing ILS systems, 
and together with uh, Jacob Jaskov, who's also doing user experience, but a bit more on the strategic side, so more uh, future-oriented, more high-level. Um, and then uh, the process continues after I'm uh, getting close to the end of my process. I hand stuff over to uh, John Coburn, who's a front-end developer, and he's developing the, the code that you can see when you open up the program. And then that code goes on to uh, be functionalized or turned into real code by uh, Jason and Nils Eric from Index Data and, of course, the rest of the Index Data team. And there are lots more people involved in the project, but these are just the people who have a very big influence on the, uh, in, on the UX, um, yeah, the user experience, basically. So I'm designing the interfaces, but I'm doing it together with all these great people to, to make sure that the strategy makes sense and that the, the code actually does what it uh, works for, for people in practice. If you break down this process a little bit, um, the UX process, it usually, my UX process usually works something like this. So I, um, I do something that not a lot of uh, people do in that I, I help companies build software products from, well, I basically help out from the uh, hearing about the big idea that someone has and then all the way to creating uh, wireframes and even final design sometimes. Sometimes, And the reason that I, I do that and the reason that that works well for me is that oftentimes a lot of knowledge is lost in, in each of these steps. So if we look at the, the um, process down here, starting with requirements, specification and discussion, going on to sketching and bits of prototypes, an internal evaluation prototype, interface design, then a finished prototype, then testing that out with some users and adapting it, and then doing some documentation and dialogue with developers. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of steps, and oftentimes if you, have a, uh, if you have different people at different places of the process, uh, a lot of the, of the strategic talk, thoughts that can come out uh, when, you, when you're doing talking about the requirements and thinking about how to fulfill them and all the peripheral ideas that, that people might have in that process. If, if, uh, if one person is handling all of this stuff and then hands it off to another person who does the, the, the more final interface design, then you lose out on a lot of great innovation that could happen there because oftentimes uh, in practice when you sit and create an interface, uh, you figure out that, oh, you know, the plan was to have this text here, but there's no space for it. And we wanted to do this, uh, these buttons here, but how does that work? If we need to support touch screens and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I'm helping out with the whole process, and uh, that's also what you're going to see in the, some of the visuals I'll show you. Um, yeah, so usually I start out by doing a, a bunch of sketches. Um, I'm... Uh, yeah, I have my notebook on my, I just started using a tablet for it, but otherwise I'm just usually using a paper notebook. It's full of little ideas and sketches that I do, and I often do it together with people who, who know about the industry that I'm working with um, to make sure that, well, basically to have a very quick iteration over a design concept. So I'll do a sketch and talk to them about how that might work, and then I'll adapt it and we have a further discussion. Um, and then, uh, yeah, of course, I, I spend a lot of my time talking to the people who will be using the product uh, or who might be using the product in the future. And, um, and then I oftentimes also, um, at some point in the process, start doing interactive uh, prototypes. So, yeah, so, so stuff that you can click around in and, and try out some animations and some different things. Because uh, it can really help a lot with uh, figuring out how, how stuff feels, not just how it looks in a static image, but, you know, how does it feel if you have to toggle these uh, labels on and off? Does it work or does it confuse you as a user? Um, so I get into that and then at some point I go over to something more final, uh, working in Photoshop or a similar program to create a high fidelity layout. And the reason I do that 
uh, even before all the decisions are made, is to try and figure out in practice, you know, how many, if you have a scanning app, how many items can you actually have on the screen at a time with the proper font size and how much metadata do you need to show and all these little details that need to play together. Uh, so that means that the, the work that I do um, oftentimes um, the, all the, this, the results of what I do it oftentimes looks like this in a curve um, that it starts out with some thoughts and discussions, ideas, it goes over to something more tangible uh, but still rough sketches, prototypes, starting over and then at some point you start tuning into the right direction and that's when things start to go fast. So then you, once you've found the right direction it's really just a matter of uh, spending the time to try out in practice how can you create the best interface with all the knowledge that, that I have and my colleagues have about how to create good interfaces. And then we get into uh, refining the designs and prototype, uh, doing some prototype coding which is what uh, John is, is working on and then when that gets turned into functional code and initial deployment, I mean the, the amount of realness in the in the design increases uh, very much, very fast at the end. But there's a long time at, before that where you don't uh, you don't see that much because it's it's more under the surface and more trying to find out uh, the direction of things. And so right now we are around here. Uh, I'm uh, I'm refining the the designs and we are starting to doing some prototyping and uh, yeah, so that's just, that's where we are right now. All right, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, structure of this platform that we call Folio. Uh, this is a, I'm going to be going through a conceptual overview of uh, how, how concepts are structured, how the information architecture, what that looks like. Uh, so, the, the three legs that Folio stands on are the three things that that make up what we can call a, an LSP, I suppose, um, is the data, uh, a, a UI framework, and, and apps. And I'm talking, of course, from a UX perspective and, and a UI perspective, not from a technical perspective. That diagram would probably look very different. Um, so if we look at the, um, yeah, so the data, the data leg is all this stuff that we have, like the data models and the, what goes into a patron record and what goes into an, a bib record, how do you edit it, what format should it be in, how does the title of a work tie in with something else, how do bib records relate to item records and so on. Um, I'm not going to be talking that much about that right now because it's something that we're still discussing uh, discussing a lot. There is a direction, but the specifics of it are are still being discussed, so it wouldn't make much sense for me to talk a lot about that. Then we have the framework, uh, the UI framework, and uh, that uh, that consists of some universal elements, some uh, a toolkit for the UI consisting of some predefined elements, pre-packaged pre elements that third-party developers can use to create apps for the, for the system. Uh, and, uh, and that toolkit, um, yeah, that toolkit contains the elements, the, the UX guidelines for that, as well as some templates for some apps. Uh, and I'll be getting into to the details of that uh, in, a, in a few moments. If you look at the apps, we have a few different types of apps that could be made for a system like this. Uh, we'll definitely want to be making some kind of automation plugins for the system. We'll definitely be making some kind of system-wide apps that can be installed. So if you are running an institution, you can choose to install a certain module in your in your setup that all the users that you give access can use. Uh, and there is also the chance of uh, doing some user-specific apps, perhaps. And there's a lot of implications on that. That's why I write uh, maybe on that one. But basically, each user, each end user in the library could install their own app. So if you're a cataloger, you might want to install an auto transliteration tool. And if you're 
doing uh, stuff with uh, Chinese cataloging, you might want to have a plugin that can translate the years of the of the Western calendar to the Chinese calendar and so on. Um, yeah, so let's look a little at the framework. So, um, yeah, I know this is very abstract. I'll be showing some examples later on, but just to make sure that I, that you guys understand where all these ideas are coming from, I'm gonna quickly run through all the the um, where we got our ideas from. Being, we've been looking at other ILSs. We've been doing research at libraries, talking to people about their workflows and their systems. We've been thinking about where the library industry is going. Uh, and uh, of course, this open source idea of the whole technical setup informs very much what, what the UX needs to look like. Uh, and then we've been looking at uh, other systems. We use some of the same technology as we're going to be using web-based technologies to, to glean from that and, and get some good inspiration. So that's stuff like you know, Facebook, Slack, Trello, they do, they do very well in terms of UX in a browser. And then we're going to be merging that with some more desktop-like interfaces and operating systems like uh, yeah, uh, Mac OS X or Windows and the apps that you use there because this is really, a, well, it's more than a productivity tool, it's a, it's a platform, right? So it's a bit like trying to build a, an operating system in a browser because we're doing it on web technologies. And the, and the technology for web is getting so good that that's not an issue really. You could do some, some really good stuff. Um, yeah, so talking to all these people uh, at the at the universities, looking at what's happening in the industry, what other software systems look like, we, we we found out some things that we shouldn't do and some stuff that we should do. And one of the things that we absolutely believe we should support is multitasking. So uh, yeah, I mean you, that can either be doing um, like handling um, data and that you need to move between different types of apps in a system or just picking up your workflow if you got interrupted because you in a work in a library there are lots of stuff going there's lots of stuff going on and you can't always do what you want in one sitting and also sometimes you need to go and talk to your colleagues about what's going on so that seems to be very important a very uh, practical thing that we saw in some places was also that um, that uh, sometimes the, the workflows uh, of people who are working in web-based ILS were hindered by bad internet connection. And that shouldn't happen, of course. So we're going to be building it in such a way and encouraging third parties to build, them, build, they build their apps in such a way that um, that uh, you, you do what you need to do on your computer and a local copy is saved using some web technologies. Uh, and then that stuff is synced to the server as soon as you get online if, if you have problems with the connection. Uh, and um, if you are online, we, we want to take, uh, take, make use of technologies like Socket, et cetera, so that when you edit something on your screen, then your colleague at the other end of the institution can see it right away if they have the same page open. In some situations, that's a, a lifesaver because uh, you don't want to be um, editing the same stuff. And if you're doing like uh, task management and stuff like that, it's, you can't sit and refresh your browser all the time. It's very practical considerations, but, uh, but very useful ones. Um, Using uh, intelligent defaults is also something that we think is very important, making sure that the choices that we make for the defaults of the system, if you don't customize it too much, will work for 80% of the people using the system. Uh, obviously, libraries are a diverse uh, group of institutions, so you, you might not be able to, to hit 80%, but oftentimes the core functionality that you need and that a lot of institutions need are, are the same, so we think we can do that. And we also encourage third-party developers to do this. So, so these principles that I'm walking through are all um, principles that we intend to follow and we strive to follow in, in the, our development and our UX, and it's also something that will go into this uh, UX guideline uh, um, that will probably take the form of a website for third-party developers to, uh, to, to take inspiration from. 
giving feedback to people in the interface, making sure that uh, you know what will happen or what, or what has happened if you perform an action, the system tells you that it's been performed and so on. It seems banal and it is, but it's often not done very well, so that's why we've included it. Um, um, in libraries, there are a lot of experts, and but obviously new people come along sometimes, and uh, we want to help new new people uh, who are either casual users or, or who are just learning the system uh, to uh, to do a good job and to feel comfortable using the system. So, uh, in the system, there will be a point and click way to do everything, uh, or more or less everything at least. And um, and we might consider using a beginner's mode for some very complex apps. The apps that we are looking at are, uh, currently don't have the level of complexity to to require this uh, different modes of usage. But it can also be stuff like the first time you use the app, there is a wizard that takes you through very quickly, and uh, and it, and it gives you an interactive tutorial, so asks you to do some things so that you can learn the, the system. But most, yeah, a lot of people that we talk to at libraries are more what I would call super users. So even the people who aren't technically, um, uh, who, who aren't super technical, they just very good at using this technology that are and that is available. Both the, the ILSs and the academia.edu and a lot of different online tools, simply because it, it's a means to achieve their end, which is to do a good job. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're definitely going to be supporting that with a lot of shortcuts and hotkeys, automated workflows, etc. We're going to be supporting different screen sizes down to probably mobile tablets, and then we're going to do an extra effort to make sure that if you're sitting on a large monitor, 24 inches would be considered large now, I guess, 24, 27, 30 inches that we make sure that we don't waste that space because most web interfaces are built maybe for medium-sized monitors and we want to to make sure that you can be extra productive if you're actually sitting at a good workstation. Uh, we're trying to support both point and click with a mouse and keyboard as well as touch interfaces so that the, the interfaces will work in the future as well. Uh, we try to use the same names for the same kinds of things in the UI. Um, and of course, we we make a big effort to make this a global system. So, uh, using the right encoding, multiple alphabets, localization, uh, and um, yeah, making sure that the system is basically usable by by everyone, not just by uh, by certain people in certain countries. Uh, another thing we we want to do is code for real speed. So, making sure that the code is efficient, of course, and the system is fast, but also uh, giving the impression that the system is fast because that makes the people who have to use it less frustrated. And you, you see that a lot used by modern uh, tech companies using things like skeleton loading, constant placeholders, uh, caching stuff, etc. Tracking changes is something we, we find very important, so we're going to try and uh, support that as much as we can from the framework side of things. Uh, and we also think that for a lot of uh, cases, users will want to adapt their interface, either for a particular you know, situation or for uh, their, their personal preference. So that's stuff like how big do you want the font to be, how big do the panels need to be, uh, what, what language, what, what uh, theme do you want from the interface, and so on. And so having talked about all those uh, principles, Let's look a little bit about at the, at the these universal UI elements. So, yeah. So if you look at the at that, if you think of those bubbles I showed before, then we have uh, the, the principles uh, that I just went through, and then we have some some stuff that's universal to the system. So yeah, let me just show an example. It will make it much more easy to understand uh, and easier to talk about. So. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on a, an interface that can contain a lot of information and um, that also uses the, oh, and therefore uses the space efficiently and also it's easy to, to understand and get an overview of. So 
the the main universal element in the system is this header that we have. So that takes up roughly that takes up 44 pixels at the top of the screen, uh, and all the rest of the screen is reserved for whatever app you're running. So there's plenty of space for even uh, tables with large amounts of content. Um, yeah, uh, basic, which is the kind of information that's used a lot in libraries. So. Um, and this header is divided up into a few different sections. So we have the, the app that you currently have open as well as the page you're on in that app or the modal that you have opened or whatever it could be uh, is, is shown here. So you see the app and then you see the, the sub pages that you have opened. That means you can always get back to where you came from and you can easily see a hierarchy of where you are. So if you, you're in the search app and then you search for a filter and then you're opening a patron and from the patron you clicked on a bit record or an item record and you know you'll be able to browse the, the system like that and it will always keep you up to date on well, where, where did I come from so this is a hierarchical breadcrumb not a not a time-based one uh, but but it's showing the, the the hierarchy of where you came from uh, Right-clicking on an app icon anywhere in the system uh, allows you to open the app settings or open automations that are connected to this app. And I'll get into that a little, little later. Um, yeah, the app list is, is um, so you see here in the interface we have this uh, we have this app that's currently open. Then we have a section with uh, other uh, apps that I've opened recently. So. I'll be able to, to quickly travel through those and have them accessible. If I want to add more uh, apps to, to this little section, then I click on this plus, and then uh, it will basically open up a menu like this. I don't know how fast the screen refresh rate is with you guys, but um, yeah, it allows you to open up here and it automatically focuses on this input field, and allowing me to search for or well, add patron, let's, let's say. And uh, so either I can see just the apps I have in here, or I can see the apps and their subsections, or the main functionality of the apps. So that if I forgot what the app was called, but I remember I have to do something with patrons, I just write patrons, and then this view will be filtered down uh, as I'm typing. Um, yeah, so that's the, the app list. Uh, we have notifications, and that's a consolidated or unified view for all the apps in the system. When I click on this notification thing here, I see all the all the stuff that apps want to tell me, uh, and I can also focus on the individual apps if I want to do that. Uh, then a small feature that I think might be very useful is this full screen mode, where I can click on that and go full screen, giving more more space. Uh, so getting rid of all the menu bars from the browser and so on. Uh, there will be in the in the framework itself a chance for the user to adapt the stuff I just talked about before font sizes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on lists, you'll be able to filter if you want to view the patron name or the if you want to view the patron name and the phone number and the address and the photo, whatever you want to look at. Because uh, we can make a good default, but maybe your what you need to look for is, is a little different. So you can just toggle that on uh, ad hoc as you go along. Uh, there will be shortcuts and they will be user changeable, so you can set up your own shortcuts for opening apps, uh, going to sections within apps, um, and changing the key and the shortcuts that are already in the system um, for different functions. There will be an app switcher in the framework is the plan, just like we know it from Mac and we know it from Windows. You can hold down Alt and press Tab. Or on Mac, it's it's a command, and on Windows, it's control. But with the tab key, you can quickly jump between two different apps, which works well for certain types of multitasking. Um, all the apps that are will have a, a GUI in the system are required to have a a settings uh, pane that that will be accessible in this unified settings app. You can all, you can right click on an app and and always open up. Um, the settings for it, but you can also just go to the settings menu and then find, you know, just changing my preferences or looking for a specific app or changing your organization and so on. And um, yeah, for the last thing in the header, we have this icon that, as we know from a lot of other systems, clicking on that allows you to see who you're logged in as, 
you can probably recognize it from the photo, but you, you get your name. Uh, if you're at a circulation desk, you can change that. Uh, you can open your preferences, switch users, which will allow you to log out and then see a list of the people who logged in on that computer uh, to make it fast for people to switch. They do that. Um, yeah, and then we've been talking about something like, uh, so we have a lot of records in the systems. We have, you know, bibs, holdings, uh, items. Maybe in the future we'll have different types of records. Uh, and uh, a universal idea for the system was to be able to add notes to records in general. So some systems already have a notes feature like on a patron, so you can um, you can add a note saying this person forgot their uh, umbrella at the library. Please tell them when they when they come back. Uh, but uh, but we're thinking about doing it more globally so that you can add a note to anything. You can mention your colleagues like you can on Twitter or on Slack, um, different places on Facebook for that matter. So you just mention a colleague saying, hey, you should check this out or this needs to be taken care of and so on. You can add tags and we're still discussing whether those tags should be uh, controlled from top down or if it's something the user should be able to, to invent. Uh, and you can put on pop-up triggers. So for uh, an example, you could, you could say when this item is received, please preserve the dust jacket and send it to my desk. Thank you. And then you can set the trigger so that whenever the item is scanned the next time, that pop-up will, that note will come in a pop-up to the person scanning it. Um, yeah, so those, that's, that's it for that. So these are the, the universal elements, so the stuff that will be in the system from the, from the get-go. And then we are building a bunch of elements to make it easy for third-party developers to do their job. Basically trying to get out of the way and, and, uh, and just provide third parties with, uh, with the stuff they need to make a good app. So we are um, making some, some nice uh, elements, I think, uh, stuff like navigation sidebars that are, uh, by, that by using these we can automatically support, uh, or by using any of the elements in the, in the system, we allow for very wide glo like global support. Uh, because of the, the ability to change alphabets, which is not a trivial thing. It has an impact on the design, on the line height, on the rendering of the fonts, etc. And also, uh, we can do stuff like uh, right-to-left uh, interfaces for countries that, uh, for languages that use that. Um, context menus is something that hasn't been used much on the web because the browser support has been bad, but with modern web browsers, it's not such a big issue. So we're planning on using that a lot to using to having a lot of functionality available to users in, in the context they're in, but um, but without all the clutter in the UI. So context menus being right-click menus, the, st the stuff, the options that appear when you right-click on something. An example of that could be for change tracking. So for some existing systems, if you go to a page and you want to see a list of names of branches, uh, circulation desks, roles, whatever it could be, then you get the content and then you get metadata that takes up 80% of the view, which is not um, so good if, if uh, most of the time people are just coming to look at the content itself. So what we're thinking about doing is for all fields in the system, not mark fields per se, but the, the other kinds of fields, um, we want to preserve, um, or we, in the framework, we give the chance to right click on a field basically and view the whole editing history. So all the steps that people, all the times people have edited it, who have, who's edited it, uh, what did they change it from and to and so on. So you can have a pretty detailed uh, uh, change tracking without a uh, very cluttered interface. We And we're working on some other cool uh, features, drop downs that you can type in to filter, lists that you can filter content in. Um, and then we're going to be, yeah, so, so we have all these individual elements and those can be combined into app templates. So uh, uh, a general, a regular app, an, an app layout that would be used a lot would probably be this concept of having a filter pane on the left, then a list of 
items or patrons or whatever it could be, and then a preview on the right. So that kind of app we will prepackage to make it easy for someone to use that UI as well as uh, other kinds of, of layouts. Um, and um, yeah, there's also something like automation plugins um, that uh, that will be useful in the system. I think I'm going over time uh, a little bit, so that so the Q and A session will be a bit shorter than expected. But I hope that's okay. I'll try and hurry through through the rest of the stuff I've prepared. Um, yeah, so these kinds of App templates will make it easy to get started with as a third-party developer, basically. So if we look at some of the initial apps that uh, that we will be uh, that the Folio project will be developing for for this um, for this platform, it's uh, one of the things is basic circulation in the in the first instance. And um, one of the what happens in the systems. Some of the existing systems, if you want to scan something at a circulation desk, you have basically uh, a certain way you have to do it. So you have to uh, choose what you want to do, and then you have to uh, choose a an input field, um, and um, then you have to scan whatever it is. Well, you, there's usually a, an order of how you have to do stuff. So you have to scan the patron, for example, and then you have to scan the items. And then you have to scan, and then you have to click uh, OK, or confirm the stuff that you want it to do. And if you don't do it in this exact order, then it won't work. So if patron comes up to circulation desk and is fumbling to find his loaning card, and and he's and yet he's standing there with five items that you could check out while he's looking for it, uh, that, that kind of flow can be interrupted. So what we're thinking about doing for the plan for this system is to do something uh, that I call scanning. Uh, sessions so that as soon as someone scans something in the system, they don't have to choose an input field. They don't have to choose the functionality. They just take the scanner and scan something. They don't have to indicate what it is. Then the system, because of the the nature of the, the barcodes and so on, can recognize well this is a book and this is a um, this is a loaner card, etc. Then uh, you can scan. Let's say, yeah, the person is fumbling for his loaner's card, so. You, you scan a book first, then you scan another book. Then he has his owner's card ready. You scan that as number three, and then you scan this one as number four. Basically, the first uh, scanned item uh, will trigger this scanning session to start. And so depending on what your role is in the institution, what permissions you have, uh, and what the, you're scanning, it will suggest that you can do. Uh, so a uh, an interface, but not, it's not 100% done, but it's getting closer to getting 100% done. Um, it's um, yeah, something like this. So you have a, a scanning session that opens, and because you scanned a bunch of books and a bunch of DVDs, and because the, the patron is uh, has a certain, it's in a certain patron group, and he's and it's a proxy patron, so they can borrow on behalf of a. A certain person, then they are allowed to do certain things, and usually you can count, you can kind of figure out, you can make the system figure out what it is they they, they want to do probably. So then you can see, okay, well all the items are checked in, and the user is allowed to check these items out. So probably the user wants to check them out since I scan the patron together with all these books. This scanning session concept would also be useful if you're you need to scan a bunch of items and do something with them. Or something like that. Like you don't have to figure out what the correct flow in the system is. You can just start scanning, and the system will tell you based on your privileges and based on the stuff you're scanning, what is um, yeah, what what could happen uh, primarily, and also more actions. So you can get a list of everything you could do with that those things. Um, but that's a little bit about circulation. So so it's a bit different from other systems like this because it's centered around a scanning app rather than a you know, this very hierarchical um, or this very segmented way to do ILSs and that has been done with cataloging circulation and so on. Um, yeah, and um, let me just see how much I have left. I guess I've been talking too slowly um, or too much. 
So if you look a bit at um, at users, uh, permissions is something that can be really difficult to handle in libraries. We want to make it easy to understand what a permission does by giving it a good name and by giving it a good um, description. And the way we want to do it is that you can basically uh, we'll, we'll package a bunch of sets of permissions when, with the system, but you'll be able to package all the permissions you want in different permission sets and put them on users as you want. And as, when new apps are added to the system, um, you'll be able to add, see those permissions and then put them on the users that you want. So you can package, yeah, package different permissions in different permission sets. And then when you go and edit the permission sets, you can see who, which users have these permission sets what's in these permission sets, and you can package permission set inside permission set. Uh, and if you go to a user, then you can see what permissions, single permissions or permission set that user has, and remove them. Uh, for doing stuff like exporting uh, large numbers of, of records, um, we have this concept of bookmarks, where you can basically bookmark any kind of record in the system. You can even bookmark a search for records. So you set up a search, you do some filtering, and then you say, okay, I want to save the results of this search uh, for later so that if you can search your way to the content of a report, then you can just save that dynamic bookmark set um, to be used for reporting in the future. And the, and, the, and the results of that will not be static. It will be determined on when you run the uh, Sorry, someone is writing, we're scheduled until half past the hour. Are we extending the session or? Uh, so we had always planned uh, for a 90 minute session, I think. Uh, some of the communication may have com be confused, ah. but feel okay. free to take, um, run until 1230 or whatever it is in your time zone. I was told I had uh, 40 minutes to talk, so. All right, so I'll, um, I'll slow down again. Yeah, so we have these different types of bookmarks. You can bookmark individual records, like well, let's say you want to make a reading list. You 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 do the, your searches for the items you want. You you find an item here, an item there. You put all this uh, into a bookmark set. You can do that, or you can just bookmark one item. And on these bookmarks, you'll be able to add um, probably uh, something like notifications. So if you're if you bookmark a license that you need to look at a year from now, then you, you bookmark it and then you can add a, a, a reminder to look at it in a year from now. Uh, you can also add a description to the bookmark set. You can share it with other people um, and you can add text to it so that if you're finding items as you go along, um, then you can you know add, add text as you go along and, and you can filter to find them later on. So. Wherever you are in the system, because there is uh, this drop down from the header, you can just click on the bookmarks icon and you see this bookmarks pane. And you can either choose just to view your own bookmarks or you can choose, uh, click on that and choose everyone's bookmarks. And then you'll see the, the bookmarks from other people at your institution who have made their bookmarks public, only the ones they've made public. So you won't see any, you won't see all their bookmarks, just the ones they've chosen to share. Um, yeah so, yeah, so like I said, that could be very useful if you're doing, well, basically for creating, uh, yeah, th these filters, uh, dynamic filters or static filters. I'll, I'll come with some examples later on on how you could, how you might use this. Um, searching is another thing that will be one of the basic functionalities in the system. And uh, we're planning on doing two types of searching, some simple searching for the occasional staff user, where they'll be able to open up a search view and then uh, I either just search for everything and it will give you the top results for all the different kinds of content, uh, if, if there are results in each category of content. Um, or you can search for a specific thing. And uh, just like everything else in the system, there will be a lot of hotkeys and stuff you can use to choose this, but if you're a casual, uh, an occasional and casual user, then you can find and click and then choose with your mouse what you want to do and then start searching. And as you type, uh, hopefully we can make it so that it starts showing results even as you're typing if, if you want that. Um, 
Another way to search is doing a more advanced search. So getting very precise results by combining different filters and uh, and um, yeah, different filters. So you can search, for example, by and this and it works a bit like a mathematical equation. So the stuff that's in brackets uh, belongs together, and so these um, these uh, words that bind it together are binding the whole bracket together with this next one. So I'm looking for a patron name, a patron who has the first name of John and the last name that is not Doe, or I'm looking for a patron who has this exact phone number. This is a, a silly example, of course, but it's just to, to show uh, the, the, the logic of it. Um, and, uh, and this kind of functionality is also known in other systems, so it's not revolutionary as such. I hope we can make uh, a, a good UI for it that's, uh, that's easy to use, and, and, um, and the, the concept is pretty, pretty straightforward, so that shouldn't be so hard. And of course, if you need to search for something specific, uh, so this this simple search might be set to searching for everything. So people would launch this by clicking Command S for search, uh, or by clicking on the, the search field up here in the header, and then it would open up a view to search. Um, and so if you're searching for everything, then um, then uh, that, that's not always what you want. Like so, then you'd be able to filter here, but. Another way to do it is if you're in the context of, well, I'm looking for a user, so I click on the user that, then whenever we have a, a list, we allow developers to turn on the filter or the search uh, property of that list so that it's easy for, to make it, make it searchable for users. So if I'm going to the users app, then, and then it automatically highlights this input field, and then I can just start typing. So that means one click to click on users, and then I write John Doe and then it finds all the people who match that description. Um, and then it's, yeah, so this is the structure I was talking about before. You have a filters view on the left, a list of content, and then a preview. And depending on how big your screen is, we might uh, allow for, for a variation of that, but something like that. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about search, three different ways to do that. Uh, Sometimes you have to import uh, files into your system. So that could be images for your staff, like portraits. It could be a spreadsheet of users that you need to import. It could be, yeah, you guys know what it could be. And uh, what is basically the, um, my thought to make that a painless process, uh, because um, it can sometimes be painful to to do to do uploading in browsers if it's not done the right way. Sometimes the places where you have to drop a file they're way too small and it's hard. It's like it's 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 cumbersome to to do it the right way. Sometimes the the system doesn't support the file that you want to upload. Sometimes you're at the wrong screen at the wrong time, so you try and upload a spreadsheet but you forgot that you had some app open in the system, so you have to drop the importing thing, go back to the system, find the right app, find the right sub page, and then go back on your computer's hard drive, find the file, and then drop it in. So I want to make sure that that's easy. So there's this folder up here in your, your header bar um, that will basically function as a little, little tiny file system. And whenever you drag a file onto the folio interface, the, you can just drop it anywhere and it will be uploaded. Uh, and then it will be available in this little uh, yeah, this little drop down from the header just like we saw for some of the other things. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what I did with that. And maybe I have it here. Yeah, this one. So it will be available in, in a little drop down like this one, um, where you can see the imported files that you have uh, uploaded. You can choose to see just your own files or some other people's files that they've made public. Uh, you can filter by the type, see everything, or see just CSV, mark records, JPEGs. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to allow updating of folders so that if you click on this folder, you'll see the contents of it. 
so you don't have to zip a file of images to upload it. You can just drop it up. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll be able to search the files that you have if you, if you remember the name, but you can't find it in the structure. Um, so yeah, that's basically the thought of that. And then uh, if it's an app that has defined some specific drop zones, like, uh, I, and, and we're still discussing exactly how to do this, but uh, we'll definitely, if you upload files uh, like this and, the, and you just drop it somewhere on any page, it doesn't have to be this precise page that you need to put stuff in. Then it will be placed in this folder here. You'll be able to see it uh, being uploaded. Um, with this kind of uh, UI that you know you, you know it from Facebook and you know it from image uploading sites and so on that basically gives you a, a feeling of when it's ready to use in the system. Uh, and that also allows you to upload a bunch of files and then go somewhere else where you're not connected to the server. Uh, if you have VPN blocks and so on. Or, or something else, uh, then you can just drop something in and then get back to it later on. Or if you find, if you have a file that you need to use multiple times, it will be available in this field, basically. Um, yeah, so that's, it's more trying to solve a challenge with uploading in browsers than it is trying to solve a specific library problem, this drop zone idea. Um, but uh, but the idea of having the files available in the system can be very helpful, I believe, for for certain library workflows. Um, talking a little bit about automation um, is uh, yeah, that's something that's really important because the the people who are um, working hard at the libraries um, are working hard because they want to do a good job and achieve. Um, a good, a good library, a good catalog, a good whatever they're working on. So, um, doing automation is something that should be easy, and it should be, uh, yeah, it should simply be easy, and it should be understandable, and you shouldn't have to be a programmer to do it. That's what I believe. So, I've taken a few from um, from other automation GUIs, uh, graphical user interfaces like if this then that.com or the automator program that comes with Macintosh OS X um, to think about how we could uh, democratize this automation stuff. So my idea is that we could do something where um, we have this automation app and the automation app allows you to create these automated workflows flows for different things. And I'll be showing you a few examples to explain how it might work. So you have, for each of these, you have a trigger, you have a, some data that it works with, and um, you have an, an action. So it needs to do something with this data. And, and uh, when does it need to do it? Well, it needs to do it whenever the trigger is. So the trigger might be manual, it might be a calendar date, it might be something that happens, some interaction. So someone sends an email to a specific address and that might be useful, for example, if you have something like uh, theoretically a bursar or a registrar who sends you a report in an Excel file and you have to go and import that into the system every month to make sure the fines are uh, overwritten or that kind of thing. Uh, like the optimal thing would be to integrate with the registrar system and that will also be possible with the system. But the next best thing would be that you could just tell someone to send an email to a specific address and then whenever someone sends an, an Excel spreadsheet to that, or whenever something, someone sends a, yeah, a spreadsheet to that address, then it gets imported into the system and you have set up a mapping to make sure that, uh, that it gets imported in the right way. Another example would be that you have um, something like writing. So that's more for, for technical people or people who have someone to help them with the technical stuff that you can write some, some scripting for the system so that, uh, and then you take that script, you upload it into the system and then you combine it with, via, via this uh, user-friendly graphical user interface with some triggers and some data. So you might write a script that goes through a patron record and or an item record and removes the space at the end of each line in some specific field. 
uh, that's an example I heard someone talk about, or maybe it was in big records. But anyway, uh, and then um, so if you need to do that, uh, if it's something you need to do on a recurring basis, and you just need to do it for batches of things that you find manually, then the thought is that you'll be able to, with the, in combination with the bookmarks and this automation thought, that when you have this um, these bookmarks, you'll be able to click on this more options for a bookmark, and then choose uh, run automation, and then you'd have a list of all the automations you could run with that thing. So that would be the automations who would accept item records, um, or even just dragging and dropping this uh, this on this field and then dragging it into the automation app uh, to make it run that thing. And then you'd be able to see a, um, you'd be able to see, yeah, I don't know what, why I have in this in my presentation, but you'd be able to see basically the actions that are running right now uh, so that you don't you know, lock the interface when you try and do something automated, like you don't lock the app you can still just keep doing what you're doing, but all the automated stuff just goes on. Well, it's running on the server anyways, right? There's no reason why it should lock up your interface. So it can just run in the background, and if there's any conflict or something, then it can let you know, and you can get back to that flow. And also, if something is happening automatically, you will always be able to, to see in this drop-down from the header menu what, what's going on right now. Um, all right, so yeah, that's another example. Uh, it will also be possible in this concept to combine multiple actions. So you, you have a trigger, you have some data, and then you need to do one thing and then do another thing and then do a third thing with all this for each of these item records, for example, or each of these patrons. Um, so that's the thought. Another example would be a calendar event. The first Monday of each month, we do a sys integration where we want to match and update the patrons from between Folio and the and the software student information system, and then so depending on these uh, which action it is here, there will be different options. So uh, what I was talking about before with different kinds of apps, one would be that you build an actual app with a whole interface that fills up all of this and has a little app icon. And other option, and that's the I think the beauty of a concept like this with automation is that uh, most, most of a lot of development tasks that deal with um, or, or apps that could be developed for automation wouldn't have to spend time making an interface for running it, maintaining it, scheduling it, and so on. They've just developed basically either a trigger for this one, so you could write an integration with Slack and say, whenever I write something in this Slack channel, it runs this action, or whenever I send uh, a Skype message to this or, you know, whatever other system, a JIRA issue that gets created or a JIRA issue that gets tagged with a certain tag. Uh, you, could, you could combine all these different systems to create something really powerful or doing some actions. So like integrating with a sys uh, to map some patrons. Um, and uh, yeah, so this kind of uh, batch importing and overriding matching that kind of stuff is something that happens a lot. It happens for for records. It happens for patrons. Uh, so that's something we also want to support in the in the framework itself. And um, yeah, looking a little bit at that, my my thought right now is that we will be doing something where we create a, a GUI, making it easy to map different fields from one system to the other. So you have fields that are called something a little different, like name and first name, surname, last name, and so on. That's simple enough. Maybe you have something where the logic is, uh, I just, this is just an example, but it could be that the logic is totally opposite. So in one system, you prevent someone from doing a specific thing, and in another system, or in Folio, that needs to be a positive property. So you need to assign a certain uh, value to someone to be able to, to restrict them from doing something. Uh, whatever it could be. So then the thought would be in between this mapping, you can put in this very simple kind of either visual programming, uh, so you, you can do some drop to some drop downs and put in the values, or that you can just write in a like if else style programming that if this input is one, then you should output zero. Or if this input is group X, then you should output group Y over here. Uh, another, Additional idea would be to 
be able to support this kind of sub-mapping uh, set within the, the major main mapping where you pick basically a property to map, so like group in the sys and uh, a property in the folio system, so like patron group, for example, and then you can just, there will be some uh, shorthand from, for writing up all these mappings uh, or a GUI for adding many different fields. So if you ma need to map 20 different groups, you don't need to, uh, to, to, to choose which property you're mapping every time you could add sub properties to that to that mapping. And a thing that I really want to do for this system to make things easy when you want to get started is uh, creating a basic mapping template from existing ILA, other ILA systems. So if you're uh, migrating from Aleph, Voyager, Alma, what have you, uh, then we can provide some, or uh, the folio system will provide some basic um, template for mapping the properties of that system to to folio so uh, we you know we know what kind of properties are in in Aleph for users or in alma for uh, patrons and so if there's no reason why each institution would or many different institutions would sit and do the same thing and map these basic properties into folio they might have specific things that they need to map but but i think that we should make um I think it would be really nice to make some templates so that you have 50 or 80 percent of the job done in terms of mapping stuff uh, from existing systems. Um, something that would be needed to do this automation and, and be able to keep track of what's going on and when is what happening is some simple calendar UI. So there will be the plan is to have a simple calendar app in the system. Um, where you can see basically the things that are happening. So you have an automation running on certain days and another automation running every month. You have some notifications that you set up for things you need to be reminded of and so on. And other things could go in here as well. And this is a good example of this kind of um, app-based UI. So we don't have, have a calendar system for the automation, a calendar system for the notifications, and a calendar system for every other app. We have one calendar system that integrates with everything else and, and a third-party developer could spend the time and create a better calendar system that could be exchanged for this one and uh, everyone would benefit. So yeah, that's basically it. The catalog, there's going to be some basic catalog uh, in the, it has one of the first things in the system, but it's not something that we're doing a lot with. It's, uh, so I'm not going to spend time talking about that uh, now. I will later on, but but yeah, suffice it to say for right now that there will be some some simple catalog overview. Uh, obviously, if you're dealing with physical or even electronic items, you need to be able to see what your what your collection looks like. Uh, another small app in the system would be something like setting up your organization. So. What information do you have about your organization, the name, the location, what branches do you have inside? You know, you have different libraries, the music library, the law library, what circulation desks do you have, what parts of the libraries do those circulation desks serve and so on in a, in a user-friendly uh, layout. Um, yeah, so those are some of the examples of basic apps that will be developed with the Folio project itself and examples of or, or uh, an overview of the basic framework and the elements. But the big potential of the system is really that we're building it to, to uh, yeah, try basically get out of the way of developers who want to do something for it. So we're not trying to, well, the, the apps that we do make, they should be great, they should be amazing, they should be easy to use, and they should fit the workflows of real people in real situations. But that's not the, the most exciting thing about the system. The exciting thing is that one institution writes a script for something, they can distribu distribute it instantly and a hundred other institutions can, can use it. Um, so some examples of what could be done, and these are not something that's planned currently for the Folio project. We, they might be included, but right now it's all thought. So an app for uh, indexing and distributing, distributing data sets to other institutions or to even consumers 
or researchers around the world. Uh, so taking the, the repositories of the institution, making it easy to create some interface for for researchers around the world to access that um, news aggregation, taking stuff from Twitter, the, the newsletters from publishers. I know that in collection development, something like that would be very useful. And there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to, well, like, like why you wouldn't have that in an space. Only someone should build it. Creating reading lists and uh, publicizing them to web pages. So basically, that would be having a, a um, bookmark set of stuff that you created for a reading list and then uh, doing an automated action every month or every day, turning this into HTML. But someone would have to write the action to create a, a web page from that and designing the layout. Kiosk display management, uh, taking bookmark sets and turning that into slideshows that run on the kiosks and libraries. So yeah, those are some examples and there could be much more. But basically the the thought is that with these concepts, automation, bookmarks, the, the file import, and the, the, um, the app-based approach, uh, and the extensibility of the system, that we create a playground and, uh, and a strong foundation for people to do some amazing things in, in research and in academia. Um, I think it's time for, for questions. I, I would talk a little bit about the styling of the system, but I don't think that's uh, so important. Um, I will say that um, the, it, it is important, but since we're running out of time, that's not the most important thing. I'd rather do some Q&A. If you want to participate in this UX UI process and give your input or just listen in, you can uh, join the Slack channel. Uh, by sending an email to right now Peter Murray from Index Data. We're going to have an automated sign up thing where you can just go and fill in your email. But right now, it's, you have to send an email to Peter. Uh, we have weekly online calls where we talk about the science and discuss how they could be better. Uh, and then there is a discuss forum online on discuss.folio.org uh, where you can ask questions if you have something. Um, but that's. Uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much what I what I have to say right now. Any questions? Comments? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Oak. We do, we do have some questions. Um, the first one uh, ties in right with this participate uh, okay. point, uh, and that was uh, well. The question was, how do we find out uh, the type of people you've consulted or are working with, and and I'll, I'll add to that if you could go over in general the expertise of the people you worked with and, and what, what areas you hope to work on next. Uh, yeah, um, so we, um, of course, we keep some records of who, who we're talking to and so on. Um, the, if, I'm not sure I understand the question, the first question correctly, but uh, yeah, so we've been talking to uh, some different uh, libraries in yeah in, in the in the U.S. and in, in the U.K. Uh, and different parties of the project have been talking to different people. So I I can't give you a full extended and exhaustive list of who we talked to, but I'd love to elaborate on on what I know if that's useful. In terms of the, the people that we have working on this project, we, I'll, I'll just use this list as a starting point. The Jacob Jaskov is a behavioral designer uh, and futurist of some kind. Uh, and so he's studying um, fu future trends and helping people create experiences, uh, taking into account a lot of research that is done and knowledge that he has about uh, yeah, human behavior and sociology and psychology and so on. Charlotte and Dee are, I believe, both librarians. And um, so they've been, he, Charlotte has been working a lot on documenting existing software systems, so looking into how to uh, Alma, Koha, uh, to solve different uh, things that we need to solve in our system as well to, to get the basic functionality right. Uh, Dee has 
have been helping with uh, also writing some requirements and the document that specifies uh, what what the requirements would be of a basic system, as well as consulting both Charlotte and Dee. Uh, I'm consulting with them about like library industry stuff. I'm not a librarian, but but um, but I am good at designing interfaces. So talk, so my my skills combined with the knowledge that they have of a lot of different ILSs, uh, as well as practical workflows in the, in the libraries, is a, a good combination. John Coburn is a uh, front end developer doing uh, iterative prototyping at EBSCO. Um, so he's very good at taking, well, basically, the way that I use sketches on a piece of paper, he does the same with code. So he writes some code really quickly, make it, makes it work so that users can click around in it, and then see how does that feel? Or what if we change this? How does that feel? Um, and uh, Jason and Eric, they are um, a very good front-enders from uh, Index Data, working on React, Redux, and a bunch of technologies that I probably don't know enough about um, to create a very versatile and flexible system. So these these types of people are, um, but, it, but it, the roles that we have in this this project are, are usually present in any kind of um, well innovation process, but more specifically UX process because. Uh, I can't do all the things that are needed to get a good UX, and a programmer can't do all the things, and a requirements gatherer can't do all the things. But but all these roles together is usually what's needed to to get a good result. I don't know if that answers the question. But. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that was good background. Um, and of course, there have been people participating from the libraries too, as you mentioned. Um, if you'd like to, uh, Peter is the open source community advocate at index data. So if you'd like to find out more about the communications channels we're using and get set up to use them or participate, um, the thing to do is send him an email. That's Peter, P-E-T-E-R, at indexdata, one word, dot com. Peter, indexdata.com. Um, the next question is, um, is there an easy way to share the user features described today among people doing similar tasks? For example, Via work groups. Um, I so it, I guess it's possible to share this video that's being recorded, but otherwise I'm not sure I, I understand what the. Uh, no, I think the question is more focused on um, inter interaction with people in the system who are in the and and. Uh, and this question came from Cornell Libraries, and perhaps they can clarify if I get it wrong. Um, but I think this is uh, more focused on people in a in a group of workers at the library who are doing the same task to 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 sh to be able to flip work back and forth and and share the same set of resources between them instead of having one person sort of own a process. Yeah. So for the portfolio project or between themselves, I suppose it's between them, them and the and the portfolio thing. In which case, the answer would be to participate in the Slack channel and the online calls. Um, for creating a forum of generic um, generic purpose, discussing these kinds of things, I I don't know that I'm the right person to ask. But I'm guessing it's it's relating to the portfolio structure. Okay, um, next we have uh, two related questions. Um, one asking about, uh, for you to talk about accessibility functionality functionality for low vision, no vision users. Mm -hmm. um, if that will be in the base uh, toolkit or, or an add-on. Um, and the other question was about uh, the physical the physical interface for the system to, for reducing RSI type injuries, uh, which are sometimes come up in libraries. RSI type injuries being uh, uh, re repetitive stress injuries. Ah, okay. Um, so for the people with the uh, well, bad eyesight, for example, or yeah, different kinds of accessibility, um, 
there is uh, yeah the plan is to have um, different ways to customize the interface for you and you it's not affecting everyone in this institution but it's affecting your interface and the whole interface so you don't have to change it on every page and uh, that's stuff like changing the font size so making it easy to zoom in and enlarge the font until it makes sense for you without breaking the interface which is very important of course um, as well as uh, allowing for different themes. So right now we're planning to do a light theme, which is the examples I've been showing here using something like that, and the dark theme for people who prefer to read on a dark background. It would, uh, by the same logic, be, be possible to create a good um, um, and maybe more accessible theme where the, the, the texts that are less visible become more visible. Um, it, it work, if you have uh, regular eyesight, then it works well to tone down some elements because it makes it easier to get an overview and understand the visual hierarchy and the information architecture on a page. But obviously, if you have bad eyesight, then you might compromise the, that, that part and then make it all everything super legible. It, it is legible in the system now, but you can, you can always get more legible. There are always trade-offs to make something look uh, easy to get an overview. So, but if someone has input on accessibility in particular, uh, I'd love to get their input. So please uh, yeah, shoot me an email, join the Slack channel, uh, write a, an input on the discuss forum, uh, because it is something that I'm thinking about in general and also in terms of the RSI um, injuries. Um, obviously, doing something like automation and making sure that the interface follows uh, conventions for user interfaces and making sure that you can use your keyboard for going up and down lists, making sure you can select multiple items in a list. All these things that we're used to from desktop platforms that really optimize the workflow and the efficiency, uh, we want to do that in the system also that will prevent like uh, doing the same repetitive task uh, in, a, in, a, in a hurtful way. Uh, but yeah, if someone has uh, knowledge, experience, input on accessibility, I'd love to talk to them because that's, I think that's a very important topic to, to think about. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, can you, can you, do you know um, how the web technologies interact with screen readers? Would that be something that would be a, a, a separate theme or will it just work out of the box? Um, so I've tried some screen readers. They were just well, that was a matter of selecting text. Uh, I'm, I don't have much experience in that area uh, in particular, but so I'd love to talk to people. Uh, okay, so something exciting to work on. Um, you, you mentioned um, the, the word catalog um, when you were talking, and I think it'd be good if you could clarify um, uh, if that's an internal catalog to the staff interface for the app or more of a public-facing OPAC that you were thinking Inter of. Internal. So right now we're primarily focusing on all the staff facing stuff. Uh, it's been suggested once in a while that the stuff we do for the staff might in some instances be reused almost uh, in an identical way for patrons. So um, yeah, stuff like uh, creating lists, someone mentioned that, that that might be useful even for patrons to use. And obviously, it's, it's two very different groups, and we don't want to just duplicate the interface because we can. The plan is to uh, allow for a lot of endpoints to OPAC uh, so that other companies can create great user experiences for the patrons. Uh, if we figure out that we can reuse big chunks of the staff facing interfaces and code, then uh, we might consider doing that. But right now, we're really just focusing on the, on the staff facing stuff, including the catalog. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I think we've run out of time. Um, okay. so, so I'd like to thank you, Philip, and especially everyone who, who listened in today. Um, uh, and the recording will go up uh, on, the, on the website uh, later today, and we'll send out the link to that when that's available. Um, and be sure to, to engage with Peter um, if you want to be more involved, or go to discuss.folio.org for follow-up questions. Um, within the next week, we can expect the, the first release of the platform code for developers. Um, so look forward to that and look forward to this forum again in two weeks. 
Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.